very few slides on brief. Uh, if you have any question, clarification, comment, you can stop me and ask. And uh, along the way, if there is any one or two things to emphasize, we emphasize. If not, we move a bit faster, okay? Okay, malaria is one of the endemic disease in most countries, especially in low socioeconomic countries of ours in Africa, Southeastern Asia, and even in some parts of Europe. Uh, it has been a disease with us and is believed any healthcare personnel living in this kind of the world, this part of the world, should have an adequate knowledge uh, of how the disease manifests, investigation, and how to treat this disease. So malaria is, if you look at it, is is not an English word. It's a form of uh, a particular that means from the mal. Mal means abnormal, okay? Then rear means an ear. So that's initially, that was the name, that was why the name is given malaria. There, there is a link by which, uh, why it was given this kind of name, okay? It was thought that it has some, has to do with air and other things like that. So, but we know that subsequently it was discovered that it's a protozoan infection that is transmitted by female Anopheles uh, mosquito. It causes over 300 million infections worldwide. Uh, as we said, 90% in Sub-Saharan Africa. It was estimated that about 1 million die annually. And even some went ahead to estimate that every minute or an hour, somebody is dying because of malaria or its complication. So this makes is an important for us to actually know about the disease. 40% of world population live at risk from malaria. And based on what they call a splenic rates, malaria is graded into hypo, meso, hyper, and holo endemic. Uh, I think subsequently we will know why it's classified like that. So there are four major species responsible for disease in humans. But recently, or let me say some years back, another one uh, was discovered, making it a total of five. Before it's only malaria, oval, vivax, and pulsiferum. But I think 10, 15 years back, uh, another species of uh, malaria known as uh, P. nolensi is also discovered. Okay, next slide. So this is a life cycle of malaria. It's very interesting to know the life cycle because so many drugs act at different stage of life cycle. And so the life cycle begins by if a female Anopheles mosquito bites a human. It injects sporozoids. Sporozoids are available in the saliva of female Anopheles mosquito. So it injects this uh, sporozoid into the blood of woman. As such, it also carries a particular stage of this uh, life cycle, usually at the shizon site. Shizon. It carries some shizons into its body. It also injects sporozoid. So this sporozoid quickly gets to the liver and start multiplying. When it gets to the liver, it undergoes so many changes, of which it transforms to a particular form called merozoids. So it, it, it transforms into a particular form called merozoid. So this merozoid again undergoes some certain change and get uh, if the liver, the liver releases this merozoid back to the blood, if this merozoid gets into the bloodstream again, it undergo another transformation into different types, different shapes called tropozoids, seasons, and what have you. So, it uh, if again the seasons cannot continue development in the human it needs the body of female Anopheles mosquito to continue to grow. So that's why when a mosquito, when, when a female Anopheles mosquito bites someone, it ingests parasite. It will carry this form of, uh, this stage of development of the parasite. It carries seasons back into its body. So within the body of female Anopheles mosquito, 
decisions multiply or continue to grow and form what they call gametocytes. The gametocyte will undergo further development into oocyte and oocanate. You understand? So this oocanate is, is one of the terminal stage and is one that also uh, transform into uh, sporozoite and get to the saliva of, of, of female anopheles mosquito so that during a bite, it can be able to inject into human. This is basically the summary of life cycle of uh, malaria. I believe we can, if we just lay hands on it, it it's self-explanatory. So there are various drugs that I use. Some are targeting the merozoites. Some are targeting the schizoids. Some are targeting the tropozoites. Again, sometimes the liver may not release all the merozoites. So, and those merozoites, they transform into another form called, uh, the merozoid they transform into another form called uh, hypnozoids. So these hypnozoids may live in the liver for a very long time, so that whenever there is a chance again, life cycle can continue. They transform into merozoid and get into the bloodstream and convert to tropozoid cheesons and what have so that's why sometimes the bite could be a year or two years, but the symptoms they may look after one or two years. And that's why somebody living in Africa can go to Europe after one year or six months develop malaria. Because most likely he harbors some of the uh, hypnozoids. They were not able to be released into the blood. They remain dormant in the liver, but when they get a favorable environment or uh, like low immunity or some other factors, the life cycle can continue from where it stopped. This is very important, okay? Yeah, so next slide. So we need to know this life cycle very well because uh, it's, it, 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 it helps us during the uh, choice of the drug and some other uh, aspect of the disease. Next slide, please. Okay, um, look, let's go to the clinical features of malaria. The clinical features of malaria are usually non-specific. Fever, body weakness, feeling of unwell, nausea, vomiting, joint pain. So these are some of the features. Malaria can also come with abdominal symptoms. Again, sometimes if particular organ is affected, one may come down with the features of dysfunction of that, that organ. Like if the malaria affects the kidney, quantum malaria or malaria nephropathy, one may come down with some urinary symptoms, swellings and other symptoms. Again, malaria can affect the brain. So one may come down with loss of consciousness, convulsion, uh, alter sensorium, uh, behavioral changes. So the symptoms depends on the uh, systems affected. However, majority present with fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, malaise, and some other symptoms. Okay, so back to the slides. There are known mechanisms by which the plasmodium pulsiferum cause the disease, meaning pathogenesis. Some believe if the summary of that is adherence of those malaria parasites to the epithelial lining called what they form, what they call cytoadherence, okay? Again, sometimes they clump together and form what they call resetting. And again, causing obstruction to certain uh, blood uh, vessels leading to so many organs and causing dysfunction to that organ. Again, because of the effect of hyperparasitemia, there are a lot of parasites in the blood. So, so these are the three basic mechanisms that underlie most of the features and complications seen in uh, malaria. Next slide. So as we said, fever, Headache, muscle pain, weakness, vomiting, and again, symptoms of the organ affected and symptoms of complications. But the fever in malaria can be classified into several types based on the duration. Is it 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours? So fever could be quotidian, tartian, or quarter. Okay? So each space, each, each species of malaria has specific uh, types of fever, duration of fever it presents. I think I'll give you that as an assignment. Uh, Polyciferum, which is a quartan or tasha, okay? Of all, so different species have particular representation in which they have. Some of them 
have quotidian, they're up to 48, 72 hours, some up to 72, some up to 48 hours, some up to 24 hours, okay? So the progression of fever, uh, the bills on that uh, can be read into this quotidian tension and quad. But please, let's just know which one present with quotidian tension. But I don't think it's much important, but it's good to know. Next slide. So if you examine a patient with having malaria, what are the, some of the si signs you get? Some of the signs. One, somebody may be febrile, okay? Because fever, fever is one of the common, uh, common presentation. Again, because fever, they can have hemolysis and develop pallor. So they can be paid because of so many reasons. One of the reasons is because of the hemolysis, okay? They could also present with jaundice also because of hemolysis or because of the liver affectation. Malaria can affect liver. They can have diaphoresis. They could have alter sensorium, especially if the malaria is severe or cerebral. They can come down with circulatory collapse and they can come down with pulmonary edema. So I want to ask, please, which form of malaria come down with circulatory collapse? It could be important to know, please, anybody? Patient with malaria coming down with hypotension, bradycardia, whatever. Anybody? Okay, that malaria is called algid malaria. You see in an MCQ, algid malaria. These are malaria that comes with circulatory collapse. It's given a name called algid malaria, A L G I D. Okay, next slide. So, what are those things that you see? Again, if you do uh, malaria parasite, you may be able to detect uh, hyperparasitemia. Uh, patient may have weakness or prostation. Very, somebody is feeling weaker than normal. Uh, alter sensorium. Uh, if they develop pulmonary edema, they may be in respiratory distress. They may have seizures, okay? Especially if the malaria is severe or cerebral. Uh, they could have circulatory collapse. Malaria is a one of the common cause of DIC. Malaria can cause disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. In fact, in this environment, it's one of the common cause, and patient may present with uh, bleeding from all the orifices. Next slide. Again, because of ax patient may develop acidosis, especially if they develop renal impairment, so they can come down with acidosis. Again, in some form of malaria, there is precipitation of hemoglobin in the urine, causing renal failure. So especially in pattern malaria nephropathy, again, malaria can lead to anemia and hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia, malaria is one of the cause of, severe malaria is one of the cause of hypoglycemia. Um, malaria causes anemia in various ways. I don't know, this one is a very important, it will come out in the exams, okay? It's good to know as a doctor again. So can anybody tell us one of the one, two, three of the causes of anemia in malaria, causes of malaria, causes of anemia in malaria? Briefly, so that we quickly go to the next uh, lecture. Anybody? Hello. Okay, one of the causes is because of hemolysis. So malaria can cause hemolysis and therefore anemia. Okay, red blood cells are being hemolyzed. Okay, two, malaria can cause dysfunction of the bone marrow. Bone marrow is a factory that produces red blood cells. So in the case of severe malaria, bone marrow function will be suppressed. And that can lead to anemia. Again, malaria can cause severe vomiting, nausea, and if it's prolonged, poor intake, excessive loss of nutrients, uh, one may present with malaria. Okay. Then it was shown that severe malaria is linked to folate deficiency, especially in pregnant women. So that could also be the cause of. Uh, Anemia in malaria. Okay, so these are some of the causes. Okay, hypoglycemia, yes, is one of the, in fact, it's one of the criteria for diagnosis of uh, 
uh, severe malaria. Next slide. So what are the complications of malaria? This malaria could be cerebral, could affect the brain and transform into cerebral malaria. Then black water fever, especially if the kidney is affected, if the hemoglobin is precipitated in the kidney, they can cause, come down with what they call black water fever. Again, quantum malaria nephropathy, hyperreactive malaria syndrome, otherwise called tropical splenomegaly syndrome, is one of the complications of malaria. Patient come down with massive splenomegaly without other hematological uh, manifestation. Then in pregnant women, about miscarriages, fetal wastages, and if the um, if, uh, if the, um, Bet of a baby with uh, intrauterine growth retardation. Okay, so even uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. Okay, so these are some of the complications of malaria. But don't forget, we said disseminated intravascular chyglopathy. It's one of the uh, most lethal complications of uh, severe malaria. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So, what are those investigations that we do? We do rapid diagnostic tests commonly, uh, but again, we can do thick and thin and thick blood smears. We can even do serology, PCR, okay? We can do full blood count to check whether there are other associated uh, complications like anemia, low platelet because of BIC. It will also help us to, to rule out differentials, whether we are dealing with more of an infectious disease by looking at elevated WBC. We can do liver function tests. We said malaria can affect the liver. We can also do uh, electrourea and creatinine to check for the kidney function. We just finished saying that malaria can cause hypoglycemia. It's one of the cause. So you can check for the glucose. We can also do urine microscopy. So who can tell us why, what thick and thin blood smear, blood film will tell us? Hello? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, the thick film is to uh, identify the amount and presence of falciparum. Uh, no, plasmodium. For quantification, for quantification, Abi. Yes, the amount. Right. And then the thin is to uh, know which species of falciparum it is. Uh, okay. Plasmodium it is, if it's falciparum or malaria. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much for this wonderful contribution. Okay, thin for specification. We want to know the species of malaria. We want to quantify. Uh, it may it may be above the scope of this discussion. If they say malaria is one plus, it means something. Two pluses, three pluses, four pluses. You understand? If you identify, okay, maybe. So so these are some of the investigation that uh, we like to do. Next slide. So what are the differential diagnoses? Any disease that can cause fever could be wet uh, body pains, jaundice, body weakness can, can be a differential. So any cause of febrile illnesses, okay? Yesterday we discussed hepatitis. Hepatitis in early stage may just present with recurrent fever, loss of taste, body weakness, feeling of abnormal, you understand? So that could also be a differential. Salmonella is a very good differential. Many patients that have salmonella, they were told that told themselves they have salmonella. They actually have malaria. It could be upper respiratory tract infection. It could be meningitis, especially if somebody presents with CNS symptoms. Okay, so sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between meningitis and cerebral or severe malaria. Next slide. So, who are the people that are more vulnerable to contact malaria? Children less than five, pregnant women, sickle cell disease patients, non-immune adults, meaning adults that grew up in an environment where there is no malaria, like in some part, many parts of Europe. Splenectomized patients, patients that their spleen is removed for the reason or the other, or they have a trauma that led to loss of their spleen. HIV patients, that's why it's advocated some of these patients, they need to have prophylaxis, especially the sickle cell. And that's why they are giving proguanil, what they call paludrin daily, okay? Because malaria could be very lethal in them. So you need to protect them. Pregnant women, yes, that's why they are giving intermittent 
uh, IPT, Abby, treatment for malaria using fancy. Them. And that's why, again, some people that are coming to Africa, that are living in Europe, when they are coming to Africa, they need to take some prophylaxis okay, for malaria. So, so these are the people that are more vulnerable. And most of them, as you see, they are in one form or the other taking the prophylaxis for malaria. And the commonest drug they take is progonin. Next slide. So what are those anti-malarias? There are various classes of drugs that have anti-malarial activity. So I will, we just mentioned them, but I will give us practical view of how to treat malaria because we need to know how to treat this disease. Very soon you start your housemanship, you are in position to be treating patient, okay? So some of the drugs are called quinoline derivatives, like quinine, mefloquine, halopantrine, and amelioquine. Some, they are antifolate, but they have some malaria, anti malaria effect. They, they are antifolate, pyrimetamine, sulfonamide, progonin, okay? Some, they inhibit ribosomes. They are clindamycin, tetracycline, though we don't use them commonly, but there are indications for use of them. But the most important ones recently are atemicinin derivatives, okay? Atemicinin, atemita, atita, and atesoli. Next slide. So the treatment depends on which species, depends on is it oral or parental, depend on are you are you trying to clinically suppress the malaria or you are aiming at radial uh, radical cure. So let me just give us practical view of treatment of malaria. If somebody has malaria, one plus maybe mild form of malaria, WHO guidelines says we should use atemicinin based combination therapy. There are commonly three atemicinin-based combination therapy. There is what they call atemicinin, atesonate mefloquine. There is atemicinin lumifantrin, atemita lumifantrin, sorry. And there is atesonate atemicinin mefloquine. Okay, sorry. So let me repeat again. There are three common combinations. One, atemita lumifantrin. This is the most commonly widely used oral antimalaria. Then there is, uh, we said there is atem, uh, atemicinin, uh, atemitalumifantrin. There is atemicinin mefloquine. There are atemitalumifantrin. Uh, so, but atemitalumifantrin is the most commonly used. So if somebody comes down with malaria, he's not vomiting, the malaria is simple meaning it's mild form of malaria. It does not uh, weaken someone. He can take orally, there's no vomiting. You give oral anti-malaria. And the drug of choice is atemicinin-based therapy. And among atemicinin-based therapy, the one we have commonly is atemitalumifantrin. It's taken for three days. Some combination comes to uh, try two drugs in the morning, in the night, for three days. Some majority once in the day, once in the morning, in the at night, for three days. But before, before, it used to come as four tablets in the morning, evening, for the three days. So again, if somebody has simple malaria, but he's vomiting or he's becoming weak, he cannot take orally, you can give him intravenous anti-malaria. In this case, for just simple malaria, it's better to use atemita. Atemita is given as 3.2 milligram per kg. You can Combined. give it in divided doses. You can give it daily for three days. However, if somebody has malaria, it's severe, meaning you do MPs, you've seen three plus, it has evidence of hyperparasitemia coming down with some of those complications that he qualifies for criteria for severe malaria. That means there is no room for oral. Even if you can take oral, you better give intravenous or intramuscular. And the drug of choice for this is atemita, either IV, atemita, or IM, but it's better to give IV or you give atita. So the various parental drugs for the treatment of malaria are atemita, atita, and atesonin. Atita is given as three milligram per kg daily for three days. Atesonate is given as 3.4 milligram at zero hour, 12 hour, and 24 hours. So after that, if the patient is not doing well, he cannot say, you can continue with the intravenous dose. 
or if the patient is improving, he can take orally, you need to follow up your treatment with oral anti-malaria. So you have to start with IV in severe malaria or IM for three days, then you continue with the oral for three days. Let me repeat the dose. For the atemeter, which is used, is, uh, is given IM, it's not given IV, it's only IM. You need to know the root, root of this drug yes. again. Atemeter, at, atemeter is only IM and it's given as 3.2 milligram per kg daily for three days. But some people can divide the dose. We can just give it 3.2 milligram per kg. But commonly adults, we give 160 milligram daily for three days. And it's used for treatment of mild form of malaria. If the malaria is severe, even if the patient can take orally, you don't treat severe malaria with oral agents. You have to give either IM or IV. And the drug of choice are Atita. Atita is what we call EMAL. It's not giving IV, it's only giving IM. And it's 3.0 milligram per kg daily for three days. But the best one again is atesonate for the severe malaria. Atesonate is given as 2.4 milligram per kg at zero hour in the next 12 hours, in the next 24 hours. Then you follow up with uh, oral anti-malaria as we said. So this is how we treat malaria. Again, sometimes malaria is uh, cerebral. For cerebral malaria, WHO still advocates use of a drug that has more penetration to the central nervous system. And in that case, Quinine is one of the most preferred agents. However, we don't give quinine like that. We give it in a fluid, and that fluid must contain glucose. And because of the effect of uh, quinine uh, for hypoglycemia, quinine is not to induce hypoglycemia. So quinine is given as loading dose of 20 milligram per kg start, then 10 milligram per kg in 10 mils per kg of glucose containing fluid to run about four hours, eight hourly have several doses until when the patient uh, can tolerate oral agent, okay? So after three days, you can give daily doses of this screening. But initially, you can start with 20 mg per kg start in 10 mils per kg of glucose-containing fluid. Then you maintain with 10 mg per kg to run over four hours, eight hours for several doses. This is in, especially in children and especially if the malaria is cerebral. Because quinine is known to penetrate central nervous system more than atesonate. Yeah. What up if the patient is a pregnant woman? Okay, I know you must have had lectures on malaria and pregnancy. So for the pregnant woman, in depend on which trimester. Are you dealing with first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester? It's better to avoid oral antimalarial in first trimester, especially those that contain septrine like pancida. And that's why even for intermittent prophylaxis treatment is given after quickening, after first trimester, okay? So malaria, whether it's simple, it's severe in first trimester, go for non-oral agent. You go for either IM, you go for either IV. But after first trimester, yes, you can give, if the malaria is simple, you can give oral agent. Again, you have to avoid anti-malarial that has uh, Septrin in the third, maybe close to delivery, but I don't. I think you must. You may have lectures on severe malaria. Okay, so but let's just let's just know that it's better to use IM IV in first trimester of pregnancy compared to oral agent. Then we can use after the first trimester we can use all the agent based on the severity of malaria. So next slides. So this is the practical way of treatment. You can see atosinate is two point four milligram per kg. Hmm? at zero, 12, and 24 hours. Please, that one, no, that one is zero, okay? Then you give it daily, depending on, if the patient is doing well, you can just switch him to oral anti-malaria for three days again. We need, you have to first give loading dose of 20 milligram per kg before you now give 10 milligram per kg. In 10 mils per, per kg of glucose containing fluid, then you revert to oral once somebody again is conscious that oh, he's able to tolerate oral, okay? Next slide. How do you prevent malaria? We, the commonest thing is to avoid mosquito bite because it's through this mosquito, uh, through anopheles mosquito that we get this one. So avoidance of, by all the means available. We can do chemoprophylaxis, especially people that have sickle cell, people that are living in non-endemic countries going to endemic countries, splenectomized patient, 
and pregnant women. And the drug we give is proguanil, as we said, that's for sickle cell. IPT is for pregnancy intermittent uh, prophylactic treatment. Then insecticide bed nets for everybody. We can do indoor residual spray of uh, agent against uh, mosquito. We can give uh, levicidal drugs. We can also vaccine. Up to now, there is a debate whether the malaria vaccine is completely available or it's not. But we hope maybe very soon the vaccine for malaria will be available. And that will help uh, most of us, especially in the African countries. Okay, next slide. So that comes to the end of the lectures for malaria. If you have any question, clarification, addition, subtraction, you can ask. If you don't have, I must ask one question before we go to the next slide. Next lecture. Any question, please? Any question? Yes, sir, I have a question. Okay, good. I'm happy with your question. I hope I know the answer for your question. So what is black water uh, fever? What of what? What is black water fever? Okay. Black water fever is a fever, form of, yes, sir. is a form of malaria, you understand, by which the patient present with all the features of malaria. In addition, his urine is looking darker. And it is known black water fever is caused by severe form of uh, malaria and plasmodium falciparum. So it's seen in a patient that has features of malaria and commonly caused by plasmodium falciparum. Patient coming down with features of malaria but in addition, the urine is looking darker. That's the name, black water fever, okay? Patient come down with fever and other features of malaria and infection and the organism again. You know, we said we have five species of plasmodium and it's commonly seen in patient that is infected with uh, plasmodium pulsiferum. And apart from the oh, symptoms yeah. of malaria, they come down with, uh, with their urine is looking very darker, okay? Somebody is asking why is vitamin C affecting malaria treatment? <laughs> I don't yeah, actually I don't know. Actually know. Actually. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know any guideline that said we give vitamin C in term malaria. Uh, I used to know, I don't know. Sometimes I heard about something like that, but I don't know whether it's actually uh, a very good practice. But if you look at recent guidelines, there's no place where it's a compulsory to give, but maybe some have done some studies and they found that it's effective, but I don't know actually. Maybe I will confirm. Or if somebody has an idea, he can help us, okay? We are here to learn from each other. Okay, next slides. We are going to discuss systemic lupus erythromatosis. Uh, systemic lupus erythromatosis is a disease that affects various organs in the body. It's an autoimmune disease. It's a prototype autoimmune disease. It affects females more than the males. And you need, in some cases, high index of suspicion for you to really diagnose somebody with systemic lupus erythromatosis. Uh, unfortunately for us, we don't have much special, specialists for treatment of SLE. But recently, gradually, in Nigeria, now we have a lot of rheumatologists, gradually, okay? Uh, in our hospital, we have almost three consultants. But I can tell you there are a lot of hospitals in Nigeria where they don't have even single rheumatologists. Even the teaching hospitals, a lot of them. And in Nigeria, it's only three centers that are accredited, three or four centers for the training in rheumatology. Uh, the one, the prototype center is in Lasuts in Lagos. 
uh, recently, maybe a year or so, Kanu was also given uh, accreditation for the training in rheumatology. So we are opportune to be seeing these cases because we live closer to rheumatology, okay? But for those of us that may go in a place where they don't have this, they should have an high, high index of suspicion and it's something to really look for because we actually have some of those cases. They are moving in the town. People are saying they have malaria, they have typhoid and whatever. Very funny, okay? So systemic lupus erythromatosis is a multi-system. We have a lot of slides, almost 60 something for this, but so we pay more attention to the most important slides. Uh, mind us, all the slides are important, but we, we discuss uh, most important ones. So, uh, is a multi-systemic autoimmune disorder with a broad spectrum of clinical uh, presentation. There is peak age of onset among young women between the late teens and early 40s. And the female to male ratio is staggering, as staggering as nine ratio one. So meaning out of each 10 cases of SLE, nine appear to be females. So it's a disease commonly affected by females. I don't want to ask you what are the other diseases that are predominantly in female. Hmm? One, thyroid diseases. Most of the thyroid diseases are seen more. And most of the other autoimmune diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is also more common in females. Graves disease more common in females. Hmm? Yes, migraine headaches are also more important. So the following are uh, diseases are more common in females than males. Okay, SLE yes, migraine headache yes, rheumatoid arthritis yes, Graves disease yes, cluster headache no. So. Uh, ethnic groups such as those with uh, Asian ancestry are more at risk of developing the disorder, and it may be more severe compared to the Caucasian. SLE is a chronic illness that may be life-threatening when major organs are affected, but are more commonly resolved from chronic debilitating ill health. No single cause for SLE has been. So there are no costs actually, but there are other risk factors that are thought to contribute to the development of this disease, which you see subsequently. However, there is effect of gen genes, genetic basis for this. Disease. There are some HLEs that were linked to this disease. However, there are some environmental and some other conditions that are known to be associated with this disease. Next slide. So the epidemiology. There are many epidemiological studies on SLE from around the world. And there is extensive data from the European and United States of America. There are few data in Nigeria actually about the SLE. The incidence of SLE in general population varies according to characteristic of the population study, age, gender, race, ethnic, national origin, period of time, but also depending on the changes in the classification. There are what you call, uh, class, there are a lot of criteria for diagnosis of SLE. Uh, the previous one was 1980 something, but recently in like four years ago, four to five years ago, there's a new criteria which we shall see subsequently. So this changing of criteria has affected some of the studies uh, done for the SID. Next slide. So what are the incidents of SLE in several studies in Europe? As we said, there are some data in Nigeria, but not as much as in other countries. In Sweden, 1982 is around 4.8. Nottingham in 1989, 3.7. Iceland, 1993.3. In Birmingham in England, it's around 3.8. So as we said, incident depend on the location, the type of study, the duration of the study, and some other factors hmm, to consider. Next slide. There are a few studies actually in this country uh, for the SID. Uh, I don't know whether the Kano published their own study, but I know there are existing studies about SLE. There is one that was completed and there are some other studies. Currently, one of my friends is working on uh, lupus nephritis. We come to know that kidney is one of the major organs affected, maybe almost 70% affected uh, by SLD. Virtually all the organs are affected. Okay, next slide, please. 
So several prevalence studies in general population also show, show marked variation. As we said, the marked variation could be due to location and what I do. This variability may result from met met also the methodology used. There are a lot of methods that can, okay, that can be used. Also socioeconomic factors. However, true geographical differences cannot be excluded. As we said, based on the location, country, region, and what I mean. And this may result from differences in genetic or environmental factors. So genetic and environmental factors, they are also known to play a role. Next slide. So these are various studies, as you can see, in several studies in Europe. Next slide. Next slide. So what are the pathogenesis? Just have an idea of this pathogenesis of SLE. But we said the actual pathogenesis was not was not true. But however, there are some postulation to regarding why and how someone developed this disease. There is what we call apoptosis. Apoptosis takes place in all the cells, meaning programmed cell death. There is a way the body handles the death cells. So there is a problem of apoptosis. It's one of the number one postulation in the pathogenesis of SM. So following cell death, there is a defect in clearance of those dead cells. That's just a summary of what this is saying. And that will lead to aberrant uptake by macrophages, which then present the previously intracellular antitrisum. So if the cell die, there is a particular way, as you said, programmed cell death, okay, that it gets rid of out of the bed. But there is a problem in that clearance of those dead cells. And the macrophage, will be sensitized and present this death antigen of these cells to T and B cells, causing the body to produce antibody against its own cells. Okay, next slide. So autoantibodies do not necessarily result in clinical disease. Presence of that, there are other factors that come into play. That's why I said up to now, the actual pathogenesis is not known. So there is, there is need for presence of other factors like genetic, environmental, some HLEs, some other environmental factors that will come to see that will play a role. Next slide. So again, again, one of part of the pathogenesis, there is postulation that there is overexpression of type one interferon pathway in patients with HLE, which they call interferon signature. So apart from those failure to clear the apoptotic death cells, there is also overexpression of type one interferon pathway in a patient with SN. Okay, next slide. As we said, genetic susceptibility. There are some HLA human leukocyte antigen uh, antigens two and three. Uh, these are also associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So they also patient with that disease. They tend to have positive. HLA-DR2, DR2. So they could also contribute to the pathogenesis of that. Next slide. So what are those environmental factors? Sunlight, sunlight, exposure to sunlight, okay? It's known to exacerbate SM. Other factors known as crystalline silica, Epstein-Barr virus, presence of infection with Epstein-Barr is the commonest environmental exposure. In fact, in some literatures, they found out that up to 30% of patients with SID, they have positive Epstein-Barr virus, okay? So meaning presence of this virus in someone's body is highly implicated in contributing to the pathogenesis of SID. Next up, so we were able to mention uh, factors. We said one, apop poor apoptotic clearance. We also mentioned, uh, Interferon activity, interferon effects. We also mentioned some HLAs, DR2, DR3 for the exams. The following HLA are here with development of SLE, DR1, DR3, DR2, DR3, DR4, DR, you understand? So HLA, DR2, DR3, yes. And we now mentioned some environmental factors like sun exposure and presence of an infection with uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which in some literature said up to 30% of them, they have positive Epstein-Barr virus. 
Next slide. So there are also hormonal factors. SLE is a disease of women. So and what physiologically differentiate women and men, the presence of some hormones in men and absence of them in females and presence of some hormones in females and the absence in male. And this way taught to also contribute to the pathogenesis because they have those hormones which are absent in men. So that's why uh, almost disease almost affects females. So those hormones, they play a role actually. And that's why up to ratio nine, ratio one, uh, the way of affectation between the male and females. Okay, so hormonal factors is also one of the things to consider. Okay, next slide. So what are the clinical manifestations? We are, we are not going to discuss much because there are a lot of things. We just need to highlight some things. So for you, for us to understand clinical manifestations, we have to divide into system. We said all the systems in the body can be affected by SLE. All the systems. So the musculoskeletal system, joints, they can cause atralgia, pain and swelling of the joint in 90% of patients, okay? And again, the way they affect the joint is poorly articular. They affect multiple joints and it's symmetrical and it's episodic. So, so again, they could have deformities. This is seen in almost 10%. So that is it. Next slide. So joints altralgia in 90% and poly and affect. Uh, so muscle again. They could have myalgia and muscle is affected in 30 to 50%. And that's why early morning pain, stiffness, muscle weakness, and stiffness is one of the important criteria. Early morning, if you have any patient with early morning uh, muscle pains and stiffness, so it's one of the things that you should consider. Okay. So uh, both corticosteroid and rarely chloroquine may cause, however, again, treatment of uh, treatment with steroid may cause myopathy, may cause muscle pain. And one of the most important drugs for treatment of disease is steroid. So sometimes steroid, apart from doing, uh, they're important in this treatment of disease, but they can also cause myopathy, worsening the patient's myopathy. Myalgia may be induced by adjacent atralgia. Uh, although only 5% of lupus patients have met ACR criteria for both SLE and polymyositis. Okay, next slide. So muscle weakness is very important. Myalgias. Next slide, please. Kidney, we come to see others, other, other organs like kidney. Kidney is affected is more than, okay. So lupus nephritis, kidney. Kidney is affected in more than 70% of patients. So if you have any patient with SLE, always we advise him about to avoid any nephrotoxic agent because the disease itself can affect kidney. If the patient is taking other things, traditional other medication that will also damage the kidney, uh, it will accelerate the development of uh, kidney affectation in this kind of patient. So almost 70% of patients. So that's why you have to be screening them by doing urinalysis regularly to detect early kidney affectation and start uh, and start uh, medications or other conservative management to prevent development of overt nephropathy. Okay, and again, if you have only a patient that you do biopsy, there is no any features of SLE, but you do biopsy, you, you saw features of SLE, it's enough to diagnose that patient with SLE. We come to know the criteria for diagnosis of SLE. Isolated biopsy, kidney biopsy that shows presence of lupus nephritis is a diagnosis of SLE. But in other systems, you need some other uh, immunological and some other systemic symptoms for you to diagnose. But because kidney is seen in 70%, and that's why if you have a biopsy of the kidney that shows features of lupus nephritis, it's enough to diagnose that patient with uh, SLE with lupus nephritis. Next slide. So GI, GI also affected, but not as much as kidney. You can see they can come with abdominal pain. They can come with ascites. They can come with dysphagia and pancreatic, pancreatitis, okay? Yeah, so they can cause even hepatomegaly and deranged liver. So various organs are affected. Next slide. 
Serological abnormalities, yes, they, is a disease that has a lot of antibodies ranging from ANA, anti double stranded DNA, uh, anti Smith, and other lesser antibodies. They are known to be present in this disease. Next slide. Again, if they develop anti phospholipid syndrome, they could have three antibodies, which there is one, anticardiolipin, two, alpha-2 glycoprotein, one, and lupus anticoagulant. This is for MCQ. If somebody develop from system, SLE is the commonest cause of antiphospholysis syndrome. If they develop antiphospholysis syndrome, you could have three antibodies, one of the three antibodies or all of them present. One, we said lupus anticoagulant. Two, we said alpha one alpha two alpha two glycoprotein one three we said anticardiolipin so these are the antibodies that are positive in a patient with uh antiphospholipid syndrome secondary to sme they could have non-specific things they could affect central nervous system they could affect skin they could also come with non-specific symptoms Fever, lymphadenopathy, they can come with renal phenomenon. Uh, fever and lupus nephritis may be striking and often requires extensive investigation, okay? They could have lymphadenopathy. They could come down with splenomegaly, as we said. So non-specific symptoms are also common in patients with SI. Next slide. So this is the latest, latest criteria for diagnosis of SI. You may need clinical and immunological. For the clinical, you need at least four, not one. You need four plus at least one immunological. But if you have one clinical, one immune, you start to think of. But if you have four and one immunological, that is almost confirmatory of SME. Or as we said before, if you have, if you biopsy the kidney, you saw features of lupus nephritis is enough to diagnose patient with SLE. So let's move to the next slide to look at what are those criteria, clinical criteria. One, if somebody has acute or subcutaneous lupus, there are various, there are three manifestations of lupus, cutaneous lupus. So if you have one of them, but let's just know about, okay, there is what they call cutaneous lupus, skin manifestation of lupus. If you have one, like malarash, discoid lupus and what have you, you understand? So one, if you have chronic cutaneous or is chronic form, you have chronic cutaneous lupus, or you have oral or nasal ulcers. Oral ulcers, if you're asking history of patient for SLE, you have to ask history of oral ulcers. But minus there are other causes of oral ulcers, okay? If you have alopecia, alopecia in SLE is non-scaring, however, if they develop some complications of SLE like discoid lupus, they are present with scaring alopecia, but ordinarily is a non-scaring alopecia. If you have inflammatory synovitis, inflammation of the synovial membrane of the joints, okay, is enough. It's, or you have serocytes, accumulation of fluid either in the lungs, in the abdomen causing ascites, in the lung causing fluid effusion, or any other part of the body. So you have serocytes. Or you have some renal affectation by using urine protein creatine index. This one, they are trying to tell us if you have like microalbuminuria, is enough to think. If you have some neurological symptoms like seizures, psychosis, mononeuritis, multiflex, myelitis. Mononeuritis multiflex is one of the presentation of SLE, but there, are, there is one other disease that presents with modern neuritis multiplex more than the SLE. SLE could be number two as a cause of modern neuritis. Somebody is having, is having affectation, a particular uh, pattern of maybe one nerve is affected in uh, multiple ways, okay? So who can tell us what are the other causes of modern neuritis multiplex? Okay, let me tell myself. Diabetes mellitus is the commonest cause of mononeuritis multiplex, okay? So 
hemolytic anemia. SLE is the cause of hemolytic anemia. Patient may come down with leukopenia or lymphopenia or thrombocytopenia. So, next slide. Back, okay. So, these are, these are some of the clinical, then immunological criteria. Antinuclear antibody is like a gateway to diagnosis of most of the other autoimmune diseases, most of the rheumatological diseases. So ANA positive, yes, above the reference range. Or you have anti-double stranded DNA positivity. Who can tell us what are the kind of patients that usually have positive anti-double stranded DNA? Anybody? Okay, I'll give 10,000. Ten thousand. Okay, the patient, people that have drug induced lupus, some drug are known to produce some symptoms of lupus, some manifestation of lupus. So, if the cause of that, if you have somebody with anti double stranded DNA positivity, you think of drug induced. That SLE is likely a drug induced. Okay, so what are those drugs? Who can tell us some four or five drugs that can? Induce lupus. 10,000 again. Okay, procanamide, hydralazine, alpha methyl dopa, and some other drugs. Okay, these are some of the procanamide, hydralazine, alpha methyl dopa. They are known to produce lupus like manifestation. Okay, and if that should be, Anti double stranded DNA antibody will usually be positive. Anti Smith is also one of the antibody that is seen in patients. If they develop antiphospholipid syndrome, they will have antibodies for antiphospholipid syndrome, as we mentioned lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1. Okay? Then they could have low complement level, usually C3, C4, or CH50. Because they develop hemolytic anemia, direct cum test could be positive in the absence. But this one, it, since you are looking at from this criteria, if they develop hemolytic anemia, you don't use this direct cum test as a criteria. Even if it's positive, you can't count it as a criteria because patient already developed hemolytic anemia. So in a patient that does not develop hemolytic anemia from SLE, you can do direct cum test. It's positive. That means you have one immunological. So we said you have one immunological and four clinical. Okay. Or even one clinical, one immunological, you start to think of SID. But for you, definitive, you may need like almost four uh, clinical criteria. Next slide. So what are morbidity and mortality? There are a lot of morbidity and mortality from SID. Next slide. Management. Management is multidisciplinary. There are, it's divided into phases, induction, maintenance and treatment of comorbidities. Next slide. So steroids, steroids are very important in the treatment of SLE, but we said we have to, if you are using steroids, we are going to use them for a very long time. And again, we have to be mindful of side effects. And use of steroid make the drug for the treatment of SLE to be more cumbersome. Meaning any patient that is on steroid for a long time, you have to give him three or four more other drugs because of the presence of steroid. So if you, that's the problem of steroid. If I'm giving you steroid, I need to give you two or three or four drugs to prevent or to reduce the complication of that steroid for you. But that is if you are going to give it for a very long time. And that is if you are going to give moderate dose for just acute treatment, maybe one week, two weeks, we may not need this, especially if you are using low doses. But even if it is for high, for, for, for very, uh, few days, you are using high dose, you need to give three or four or five other drugs in addition to the steroid. That's the problem of use of steroid. So that makes the list of the drugs used for this disease to be more cumbersome. So who can tell us what are the side effects? This one is for exams. They'll ask you, what are the side effects of use of steroids? There are more than 20 side effects of the common side effects of steroids. So who can tell us? So that if you're having patient with this, you should be looking at that, okay? Please briefly, this one you must contribute to. Okay. 
immunosuppression. Okay, good man. Immunosuppression, yes. One of one over twenty. Uh -huh. Cushing syndrome. Cushing, cushing like. Mm -hmm. uh, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, good man. Three over ten. Three over twenty. Uh, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, good for. Acne. Acne, five. Okay, someone should take over. <laughs> okay, he said somebody should take over. He has mentioned five over 20. He has tried one over four. Okay. Anybody? Delayed wound healing. Huh? Delayed wound healing. Delayed wound healing, good man. Okay, let me add five so that we quickly move to the next. We don't have much time. It's getting night. Peptic ulceration. That's why we give PPIs, okay? A vascular necrosis of the femoral head. Psychosis. They can develop psychosis. Are we together? They can develop weight gain. Did we mention weight gain? So no. weight gain. For females that want to gain weight, they take high dose of steroids. Okay? They can develop even cataracts. They can lead to pancreatitis. There are lots of them. You know, time is not on our side. So please, just know about this side effect. So that's why if you are giving steroids, you have to give at least PPI. You have to give calcium supplement because osteoporosis is common. Okay? You understand? Yeah. So, so steroids are very important. You can see the several doses. Let's go to the next drug. So you can see some of the doses in case of affectation of certain organs. You can see 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligram per kg for arthritis, skin, serositis, medium doses, you know. These are several doses, which, is, which you can read on your own. Next slides. So there are some anti-malaria agents that are also known for the treatment of SLE, notably is hydroxychloroquine. So please, can somebody tell us what other disease can be treated with hydroxychloroquine? One, two disease. All right, they don't want to talk. COVID-19, Abi, rheumatoid arthritis, they can also use hydroxychloroquine. But again, if you use it for a very long time, it's also, it, it also has some of the side effect like uh, cataract. Cataract can, somebody may lose his vision, but it's not a common complication, okay? Yeah. So, but use of hydroxychloroquine is very important. During COVID-19, patients with SLERA, they suffered a lot because the price of hydroxychloroquine pyrocated and becoming not available in the market. Because hydroxychloroquine was one of the drugs that was shown to have some benefit in a patient with COVID-19. So during COVID-19, this patient actually suffered a lot. And the drug triples, the price of the drug triples and becoming unavailable. Okay. So, but again, it's very good for reducing joint pains and other joints manifestation of the disease. Next slide. And it's safe in pregnancy. Cyclophosphamide is also one of the drugs we use. Uh, uh, it's also a very important drug. But what is the commonest side effect of use of cyclophosphamide? Who can tell us, please? Okay. Hemorrhagic cystitis is one of the things you should be looking at if somebody is on prolonged cyclophosphamide use. Next slide. Azathioprine is also a very good drug to use in a patient. You can see the dose below. Next slide. So we have mentioned how many steroid, hydroxychloroquine, cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, then methotrexate. Okay, methotrexate is also a one of the drug. In fact, it's one of the drugs that you must to give a patient, especially if he doesn't have contraindications. So what are the side effects of methotrexate? Anybody? 
okay, they still don't want to talk. Hepatotoxicity, and it can cause megaloblastic anemia, okay? Because it has antifolate activity. All right, next slide. Macrophenolate morphetil is also one of the drugs that can be used. It's not that you use all these drugs. Let me tell you, most of the patients, they are on steroid, especially in early stage, hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate. These three drugs, these three combinations are the practical, then plus some other pain relievers if they have pain, and plus some other drugs that will reduce the, the effect of prolonged use of steroid, as we said. PPIs, okay, proton pump inhibitors, calcium supplement, and what have you. So what is the, what is the side effect of use of Microphenolate morphetil. Endocrine side effect. It increases sugar. So it's not a very good drug for patients with that is battling with high blood sugar. Okay, next slide. Leflunomide is also one of the drugs, but it's not the first line. Maybe until if somebody fails the first line, or there are some other complications. Okay. But you can't just start a patient with leflunomide. Mm -hmm. And if a woman is pregnant, you have to avoid left lunomide because there is no extensive study about use of this drug in pregnancy. That's why it's better to avoid that. Next slide. Sometimes you can, especially you can use intravenous immunoglobulin. They are also advocated. Uh, and their use has been shown to be effective in treatment of hematological manifestations, serotitis, and pregnancy losses. Okay, next slide. There are newer therapies that we should know of one of which is fludarabine. Hmm? Fludarabine. Anti CD20, they will ask you in your exams. The Tuximab is a drug for one anti CD20, anti CD52. So, anti CD20 rituximab is very important, is one of the drugs for advanced SLE, a patient that has not been doing well with that. Next slide. So, there is anti CD22 again. Ipratuzumab is also a very one of the drugs used for the treatment of. Uh, SLE, but as I said, again, it's not the first line, even second line, it's usually the third line. Uh, it's really in severe recalcitrant disease. Next slide. So we can use some other drugs, TNF blocking drugs, like interleuk. Uh, we can use uh, anankira in some cases, but especially in gouty arthritis. We can use anankira and TNF1, anti-interleukin-1, sorry. Sometimes hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, sometimes plasma exchange. Next slide. Thank you, thank you. Ah, there are other, so heart is also affected, pericardium. They can cause pericardium disease, okay? Next slide, pericardium is affected in patients with SID. Myocardium again. Next slide. Valves. So for the heart, they can affect the outermost covering, the middle covering, and the valves. Even the innermost covering can be affected. Okay. So SLE, and it affect it affects the innermost covering and cause a particular endocarditis, which they are actually in the exams called they call it Lidman Sat, but Ms. book added sterile, sterile Lidman sac endocarditis. Which form of endocarditis is found in patient with SID? Sterile Lidman sac endocarditis, okay? So it's Lidman sacs or sterile Lidman sacs endocarditis. Next slide. So this is International Society of Nephrology, Renal Pathology classification. The classification is not for you, it's for patient preparing for part one exams. But you can have an idea, minimal messenger lupus, these are the characteristics. Messenger proliferative lupus, these are uh, characteristics. Next slide, there is focal. There is yeah, focal lupus nephritis, again, 
These are the criteria. I just know that there is minimal messenger, there's messenger, there's focal, okay? Diffuse. There is diffuse. This is the criteria for diffuse. Next slide. Membranous lufus, these are the criteria for membranous and how you treat it. Advanced. So we should know there is minimum essential, there is membranous, there is focal, there is diffuse. I mean, there is advanced lupus nephritis. Okay, next slide. The lungs, the lungs could also be affected. Pural effusion is one of the commonest complications in the lungs. And SLE, will, which form of plural effusion do we expect a patient with SLE to cause? Who can tell us? Which form of plural effusion? Is it exudative or transudative? You must tell us. Who can tell us, please? Will I mention name? Okay, let me say it to myself. It's usually an exudative plural effusion. Who can tell us other causes? In your exam, they must ask you plural effusion, please. Either in your MCQs or in your picture test. It's a must. So who can tell us? 10 other causes of exudative plural effusion. Because MCQ, the following are causes of exudative plural effusion. One, SLE. B, rheumatoid arthritis. C, pulmonary tuberculosis. D, complicated pneumonia. E, pancreatitis. D, Sorry, F, sarcoidosis, G, pulmonary embolism, H, nephrotic syndrome, I, MEC syndrome, J, hypothyroidism, okay? So please, you should know, most of those I mentioned, they cause exudative pruel effusion, okay? Next slide. You should know exudative and transudative. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So CNS, CNS is also one of the, we mentioned seizures, we mentioned headache, Headache is the commonest CNS symptoms of SLE. We mentioned alter sensorium. We mentioned varieties of things that could be caused by central nervous, uh, that could affect central nervous system, okay? Okay, next slides. So there are neuropsychiatric syndrome observed in SLE. So SLE, one, they can come with aseptic meningitis. Aseptic meningitis. Somebody coming with meningitis, but you cannot culture anything because it's not caused by organism. So SLE mind us is the cause of aseptic meningitis, okay? I don't want to dig more. SLE is a risk factor. If you have a patient younger age with a stroke, especially a female, one of the things you should be thinking of, will it be connective tissue disease? Could it be SLE? So you should look for ANA and double-stranded DNA anti-SMIC. Demyelinating syndromes. Patient with SLE can come with a lot of demyelinating syndrome. And they can come down with cold syndromes like transverse myelitis. Headache, headache is the commonest com complaint, com commonest CNS complaint. They can come down with some movement disorders like chorea, okay? They can come down with myelopathy like transverse myelitis. They can come down with seizures. They can come down with acute confusional states. They can also come down with anxiety disorder. They can come down with cognitive dysfunction. They can come down with mood disorders, mania, depression. They can come down with psychosis, schizophrenia, and what have you. So these are the syndromes I'll share with them. SLE. Next slide, please. So con these are other uh, syndromes, peripheral nervous system. We said they can come down with autonomic disorder, 
they can be associated with myasthenia gravis because they are all autoimmune. They can come down with polyneuropathy, but they can come down with mononeuropathy, which we said DM is the commonest cause of mononeuropathy. Next slide. Hematological, they can come down with a lot of hematological malignant uh, sim syndromes, okay? They could have anemia because of chronic disease. Because of hemolysis, they can have hemolytic anemia. Uh, they could also come down with what they call Evans syndrome. If you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia and autoimmune thrombocytopenia, that is what is called Evans syndrome. Two autoimmune, thrombocytopenia and anemia. Okay, next slide. They could have problem with the platelets, as we can see. They could have thrombocytopenia. Next slide. They could have problem of high blood cells. They could have leukopenia that can persist as low as less than zero, uh, 4.0. Next slide. So this is 1997 criteria, which we are not using 1997. We are using almost 2018 criteria. So but, but for you to know, this was the history. When we are in medical school, this is the criteria we were taught. So these are one of the old criteria, mamala rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity, oral ulcer, you know. Next slide. So this is continuation of the criteria, 1997. Next slide, 1997. So the classification is based on 11 criteria. I remember one of our exams, they asked us to write all these criteria. I think one of the question in 400, 500 level, okay? So you have to diagnose SLE using these 11 criteria. So for the purpose of identifying patient in clinical studies, a person must have SLE if any four or more of these 11 criteria. So even that criteria, you need to have presence of four. But recent modification, you need to have, if you have one clinical and one immunological, you start to think of SLE. But if you have staggering number of four, which, so you can always bet your salary that this is likely to be SLE. Okay, next slide. So these are prevalence of serological features in, in a patient with SLE. You can see how much, you can see antinuclear antibody, almost 96% of them, followed by antidouble stranded DNA, is commonly seen in drug-induced lupus. Antiro, 25%. Antiro is commonly seen in Jogren syndrome. Antila is also commonly seen in Jogren. However, if a woman is having SLE, she has antiro and antila. She has high chance of developing a baby with what they call neonatal lupus. She born a baby with hepatitis, one of the, and some problem with the hair. So antiro and antila, yes, they are seen, but they are very, that's why we said, there are a lot of antibodies, but the commonest one are ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA, anti smiths So they can also have anti-ribosomal nucleotide peptide antibody. They can have anti smith Even rheumatoid factor could be positive in a patient with SLE. They could have anti cardiolipine we said, as part of uh, anti phospholipid syndrome. They could have lupus anticoagulant. They could have anti-alpha-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody still if they develop uh, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, which is one of the complications of SLE. Next slide. Okay, thank everybody. Thank, we thank everybody. We thank the hosts and everybody. Uh, we thank the med tutors for giving us this opportunity to interact. Uh, I believe we learned one or two things and we should go and read again. If there's any other questions subsequently we can discuss. Uh, I would have wanted if it is more interactional, interactional like, uh, however, I think some few have contributed. Thank you very much. If you have any question, you can ask. If you don't have, I will ask you. Any question?
Hello. Any question, please? Okay. In the absence of question, thank you. I wish you best. I hope you guys are reading very well, are spending 20 hours every day to read. And you are practicing the practical aspects, examinations, communication stations. Hmm? All right, all the best. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank my tutors. Are we meeting tomorrow? Thank you, sir. Are we meeting tomorrow? Hello? Yes, sir, we are meeting tomorrow. All right, so we meet tomorrow and discuss more again. Thank you. All the best. Okay, thank you, sir.